episode 83 of Grace and Steel. I'm Kevin Steele. The election of Donald Trump was an obvious vindication of the alt-right, especially as Breitbart Supremo Steve Bannon was a major player in his presidential bid and has become a major player in his administration. Curiously, however, the right-wing media has reacted to Trump's triumph with something like terror. First, Fox News cleaned house, parting ways with Bill O'Reilly amid reports the Murdoch family wants to become more like CNN, the leading purveyor of fake news. And then Katie McHugh, one of Breitbart's leading lights, was fired June 5th, shortly after tweeting the obvious. Quote, There would be no deadly terror attacks in the UK if Muslims didn't live there. Unquote. Here we see the voice of scale. Talent is nothing, but the organization is everything. Katie McHugh is now an independent journalist and is writing a book about the terrible effects of the opioids epidemic on society. She spoke to Kevin Michael Grace June 18th about her three years at Breitbart, Steve Bannon's role as a mentor to her, and how President Trump is bypassing the media guardians by using Twitter to speak directly to America and the world. Well, Katie, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me on, Kevin. First off, uh, when exactly were you fired by Breitbart? Uh, it was the evening of June 4th, one day after um, I tweeted that, you know, basically if there were no Muslim migrants in London, you know, there would be no Muslim terrorism. Um, it was about 24 hours after I sent that tweet. And the media firestorm that was kicked up afterwards, I think, really spooked Breitbart. And they decided to say, it's time for us to part ways. Now, you saw a lawyer about this? Um, I just briefly spoke to them about my contract, what options I had, um, and, you know, if I should pursue a big severance package or something like that. But, you know, the fact is, is like, I, I think we ca things came to a head and it was just simply time for us to, you know, part ways and go down our own paths. But did you get a settlement? Um, I was paid for some work in June and that's it. Now, the nature of your contract uh, with Breitbart Typically, and I've been through this myself, mm -hmm. uh, being fired. And uh, if you are fired with cause, then you don't get anything. If you are fired without cause, then they have to pay you. So was it Breitbart's position that you had been fired with cause? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that question because they simply gave me um, about a week's pay. And then that was that. And I... The contract for me was difficult to understand. I do not have a legal background. So I sent it to um, a lawyer in L.A. and he said, frankly, there's nothing you can do. They, you know, they have every right to just let you go and give you nothing. So, Katie, when did you begin with Breitbart? Well, I was working for Daily Caller at the time. This was in April 2014. And uh, Matt Boyle approached me and said, well, how would you like to work for Breitbart? And I said, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so shortly thereafter, about two weeks um, in April 2014, I believe I signed my contract April 14th, 2014. And I was brought on as a homepage editor. So after um, I was trained by Alex Marlowe on how to run you know, the Breitbart.com homepage, um, I began working weekends, and that's whenever I began working directly with Steve Bannon, which, you know, was a very interesting and fantastic experience, I have to say. So tell me about uh, your experience, your life up to the time uh, that you got involved in journalism. Well, um, I was politically inclined from a young age, and um, I began this uh, path, I guess, by reading Joe Sobran at age 18. It was one essay, The Reluctant Anarchist, that sort of shook me out of whatever neocon leanings I might have had. So I continued to read Joe's writing, paleoconservative writings, you know, just the, the good traditional stuff. I never really, you know, Charles Krauthammer columns, well, they're interesting, but um, I, I, I wanted more red meat. And I wasn't a war hawk or anything like that. And I had a more traditional view of society. So I was further to the right, I think, than a lot of people in the conservative movement. Um, but, you know, at the time, there was, this is, of course, before, you know, the great breakup with Trump and everything, um, there was room for people like me. And so I try to reflect that in my writings. And I also try to touch on issues that were um, very important to the, the middle class and the working class, such as, you know, massive student loan debt. I wrote a great deal about that Daily Caller, um, illegal immigration and immigration in general. 
I wrote a great deal about that Daily Caller. And then as I worked for Breitbart, especially under, under Steve, my views about this continue to develop. So uh, tell me about Steve Bannon. Steve is a brilliant man. He's one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. He would wake up at 2 a.m. to do four hours of preparation for his radio show, which began at 6 a.m. He would do a wonderful caller-centric Sirius XM radio show on weekday drive time radio that I helped him plan from 6 to 9 a.m. Then he would jump on an editorial call at 9 a.m. and then come back to radio and review the show with us at 9.30 a.m. And that was just, that was all before 10 o'clock in the morning. And he was just always on all the time. And he was always there for you. If you ever had an idea, a story, you said, Steve, can you read this? He was like, yes, there. And he would just say, go, publish it. He was completely, he was, may have been like slightly disorganized because of everything he was, you know, running. He's He was running a media empire in the middle of the GOP primaries. And, you know, during the presidential uh, election after, the, you know, the primaries concluded um, until he went to go work for Trump. But I've never met a more loyal person, I had to say, in my life. He, it, I was a total nobody, but he had my back 110% if the media would come after me. Now, tell me about the, the rise of Breitbart, because it had been around, but it seemed to me that uh, when Steve Bannon uh, started running it, then it became a force uh, to be reckoned with, not just on the right, but on the, on the American political scene generally. Were you conscious of this? Yes, because Breitbart took on, Steve is a force of nature, and Breitbart took on that personality, and Steve surrounded himself with firebrands, you know, people like Raheem Kassam, people like Julia Hahn, you know, people like Lee Stranahan, who would go out there, who would break original news, and would be absolutely fearless in the face of the media and conservatism, Inc. attacks. And, you know, it's... And this has never changed about Steve. And you can tell how valuable Steve is because <laughs> when you see him there with Trump, he's wearing his windbreaker, you know, his hair's not cut, maybe, uh, maybe he's a little unshaven and everyone else is immaculately dressed in Armani suits. And with Trump being as image conscious as he is and seeing Steve, you know, present himself in, in, in just a very Steve way, you know, you can tell how important he is. And he was absolutely essential to Breitbart. And um, I was very glad to see him go to Trump's campaign, but I knew that things were going to change after he left, and we all missed him terribly. When you were at Breitbart, was there a feeling of uh, you being part of a gang, of you uh, against uh, your gang against the rest of the world? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd say whenever you're partnered with Steve, yeah. <laughs> uh, whenever you're writing um, super tough pieces about illegal alien crime, about Paul Ryan, about these, you know, Congress critters, these uh, Republicans who just like seem to lose and lose all over again. And whenever it's Breitbart versus, you know, not only the establishment press, but all like the cottage industry of uh, conservative media outlets telling you, you're so horrible, you're racist, you know, take Andrew's name off the site. This is awful. You know, it was kind of, it was fun. Um, we had a great time. We we're a little trolly, pugnacious, lively. And, and again, it's, it didn't, like, it was hard work, but a lot of times it didn't feel like work. What was it like when you ran into uh, Conservatism Inc. people? Um, they they weren't mean in person, but I'd get, like, sour looks. People would go to shake my hand and I'd say my name and, like, the blood would drain from their face. <laughs> so, um, I was never mistreated rudely, or but, you know, people aren't going to, like, they're not leftists. They're not going to attack you or anything like that in public. But, um, the, you know, you could tell that there was a chill there. They weren't pleased. And I guess that, that came uh, from part of being like the Breitbart gang. We were we were different from them. And um, Steve supported Cruz. He liked Cruz. But what he saw in Trump, he saw a winner. And I think that's why he um, used the site to be, you know, critical of Trump when he needed it to be, but also supportive whenever it was warranted, you know, because Trump was a vehicle for this nationalist populist agenda. Trump was a wrecking ball. Trump was Godzilla, like, stomping through the GOP primary debates. And that's something that really appealed to Steve. Did you ever get the feeling from the movement conservatives that they were beginning to understand that their time had passed? I, th I think that they, they were just upset at being upstaged. They always want to go back to, well, if we just talk about free markets some more, people understand it. And I think some of them realize, like, it's it's not just about, you know, talking about free market capitalism. 
you know, the, some of these trade deals, which are free trade deals, are eroding the middle class, just wiping out jobs and then bringing tons of labor from the south up north. And with that labor, you know, the drug trade. And for some reason, they just fought kicking and screaming against acknowledging these problems. And now whether that's because they just wanted to stay in the area, talk about things that they're comfortable with, or because they were put off by Trump's personality, or put off by Breitbart's like, you know, combativeness, um, it's hard to say. But they were so unthinkingly resistant to these ideas. And it was just, it was baffling to me to watch this. Well, I... It seemed to me that they got, c completely got the wrong end of the stick. You had Charles Cook with his conservatarianism idea, that is to say that this fusionism of the right had to become even more libertarian, even though there's no evidence that libertarianism has ever been popular politically. And, uh, you know, second, you had this phenomenon of, of Kevin Williamson at National Review uh, deciding to declare war on white people as useless. Yes, and we hammered him for that because um, he would never write something like that about impoverished black people in Detroit. And I think a lot of the, the conservative ink animus was directed at whites, uh, particularly, you know, working class whites, because it was a safe target. You know, and even after the election, you have Bill Crystal saying at AEI, well, why wouldn't you want them to be replaced? You know, if they have these pathologies, if they're suffering, just bring in more immigrants. And I think, you know... That was that was one of the great things about the Trump phenomenon is that all these things were laid on the table, all these bubbling hostilities against, you know, frankly, the people who, you know, they should be appealing to their base just came came right out. And, you know, you saw a lot of this, a lot of that rage directed at Breitbart, directed at Trump voters. There was an article I wrote, this is um, back during the primaries, whenever the San Jose riot was going on at that Trump rally. And that woman was being surrounded by uh, a huge gang of men being egged and screamed at. A police did nothing. And you had red state editors saying, well, Trump voters deserve this. They deserve to be beaten for their views. And we, we went nuclear on them for this because, you know, how dare you say that? How dare you say that about a quarter of Americans? And th these people, they, they did want Hillary to win because the scam could just keep rolling on. Well, I found that totally remarkable because if it had been someone like Joe Biden, I suppose I could have seen it. But Hillary just is the epitome of everything that is wrong with the Democratic Party, everything that is wrong with the American political system. I, I, you know, she is completely unlikable and her political career seems to be based on the idea of revenge for, you know, for personal slights, real or imagined. And here you have all these people on the right. Oh, well, you know, if it's got to be Hillary, I suppose it's got to be Hillary. I just found that remarkable. Well, so did I, because I, well, and first of all, I think if Joe Biden had run, he probably would have taken Pennsylvania. Maybe Trump would have gotten Wisconsin, but I think it would have been the fight for our lives. And there's a great chance Biden would have won. But instead they put up Hillary. And like Jeb Bush, Hillary was the perfect foil for Trump in the general election. And, you know, you have this, all these WikiLeaks, you know, her speech is coming out saying, like, my dream is, you know, for open borders. And then to have conservatives double down on that and just say, well, well, Trump, will, he'll be an autocrat, you know, he'll be a dictator. Therefore, like, whatever horrible things Hillary has in store for us, you know, flooding us with all South and Central America, that's acceptable. And Hillary was sort of the enemy that they knew. They could sort of bring, dust off those old columns, all the old complaints, and just keep lobbing them at her and just keep people in a state of frustration instead of voting for the guy who might actually solve some of our problems. Now, Trump announced for president just over two years ago. Yes. What did, what did you think, honestly, about his chances first of winning the GOP nomination and possibly the presidency at the time that he announced? I thought he would win, but I didn't tell anyone. It seemed it seemed too far fetched. But watching him talk about you know Mexican immigration, uh, illegal immigration from Mexico, excuse me, um, illegal immigration from Mexico and the crime that it brought, and no one else like Trump speaks in such a direct, simple way, and people make the mistake of calling him stupid for that. But he's communicating like direct, concrete ideas. He doesn't. He's not talking in abstractions. You know lock her up, build the wall. These are very simple things for voters to understand and to grasp and to want. And watching him communicate with people, watching the way he, you know, just roughed up the media, I thought 
if he can get through the primaries, which I think he could, then he will crush Hillary. But again, I, you know, I just sort of kept doing my job and kept that to myself because people were already outraged by him and they thought, well, this is like, he's making racist comments. We can't support him. Let's back Scott Walker. Let's back Ted Cruz. You know, but Trump was always my first choice. You've seen the clip. Everyone's seen the clip of Ann Coulter being asked who mm-hmm. she thought would have the best chance. And she says, Trump. And, and all these, laughs. everybody laughs. Yes. It's just a, it's a remarkable thing that uh, you have this revolution going on underneath these people's noses and they can't see it. Right. And they just, you know, I, I think, too, with the, the problem with a lot of conservatives um, is that they don't realize that they're in the arena when they're in the arena. And they think by playing nice and talking about principles and things like that, you know, that'll help them win. And what surprised me, too, is a lot of conservatives said, well, if we can't win by our, you know, nice, nice guy principles, then we shouldn't win at all. Hillary should just be president. You know, if we can't do this like our preferred way, then um, we might as well just give up. And that, that, that's not the way the world works. And sometimes you, you do need a bruiser. You do need um, someone with a bully pulpit to come out and defend you. Someone like Trump, who put, you know, everything on the line. Um, if he had lost, they would have come for him. They would have come for his family. They would have done their best to make sure that he and his family were bankrupt. So he was making enormous sacrifice. And that's something I like personally admired about him as a person and a candidate. Well, looking back to Pat Buchanan, Pat Buchanan was the kind of candidate that uh, the liberals and the respectable right claimed that they wanted. Right. And Pat was treated abominably by all of these people. Oh, mm-hmm. Pat's a Nazi. Pat wants to set up you know, concentration camps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All this nonsense. So I, I think that Trump learned something from that. And I think that what he learned was no more Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah, and that could have been the theme song, that Alice Cooper song could have been the theme song of his campaign. And I, people, people love seeing other politicians get their comeuppance. People love seeing him go after the media. And I think one of the best things Trump has done so far in his term is frame it as, you know, it's the fake news media against the people. Because this media, they lie, they lie, they lie. And all they are obsessed with is this, you know, ridiculous, fictitious Russia investigation. And I think Trump, you know, some people think, oh, Trump shouldn't tweet, blah, blah, blah. But Trump framing this as a witch hunt, and I like that he makes it capital W, capital H, um, is, is great. And, you know, during the primaries, too, he would call he would call other candidates, of course, as being puppets. And he'd mock Rand Paul by saying, um, you know, I gave you plenty of money. Um, I gave you plenty of donations. And he could look around the stage and say, like, I've donated to everyone's campaigns here. I know the way the system works. And that's why I'm the only person who can fix it. Well, it seemed to me, uh, as Trump uh, bowled his way through the Republican primaries, that you were getting this sense of horror on the respectable right, that, oh my Mm -hmm. God, this man could actually win, and if that happens, he might change things, and we can't allow that. Yes, well, as I said, they would be very comfortable under Hillary Clinton, because they could keep complaining, they could keep writing the same old columns, But with Trump, they were no longer in control. They were no longer in the driver's seat. And I think that that frightened them. And, you know, the right does so much of its own policing. And the fact that, you know, Trump would be willing to tweet, you know, remember whenever he tweeted that graphic about um, black on white crime and black on black crime, and the entire media lost its mind. These are the kind of things that conservatives simply do not want to really talk about. And the fact that it's brought, it's dragged back in, back into, you know, polite, well, maybe not polite discussion, but public discussion alarms them because that reduces their power to police their own movement. Do you think, was Trump reading Breitbart? Oh, yes. And I, I actually had the great honor of speaking to him on the phone once. You know, I, he did, he did read our articles. There was one moment in the debate whenever he seemed to back away from the H-1B visa um, thing, and he seemed to support it. And Breitbart wrote, you know, several critical pieces about this saying, Trump, you're breaking your campaign promise. This is why this program is terrible for, you know, the American middle class. And, you know, the next day he issued a statement correcting himself. So he is like, he is the nimble navigator. He is responsive. He does read what the base is telling him. And I think he sits up late at night, you know, reading his Twitter mentions and seeing everything that people are telling him. You know, he is in tune with us. He is in tune with the zeitgeist. And that's partly why he won. 
Well, there has been this uh, remarkable chorus of denunciation against Trump for continuing to use Twitter. And I think that this is a masterstroke because this enables him to avoid the mainstream media entirely, to communicate directly with the voters. Politicians in the past have taken the view of the mainstream media as a necessary evil. We can't do without these guys. And Trump has decided, well, I can do without these guys. Yes. And, you know, as he famously said, it's like owning a newspaper without the losses. And I'm, I would be, I would love to see uh, Trump's uh, Twitter stats. I'm sure his, he actually has well over 100 million followers. Um, and I'm sure he's doing a billion views a month, at least. And one thing that I've I've been curious about this administration is see why hasn't he been doubling down on that strategy? Why isn't he doing daily videos, daily periscopes? Why isn't he tweeting more? Why isn't why aren't his surrogates, you know, why don't where's the Trump war room against the media? And Trump too, I think it was um Mike Cernovich who suggested this. He should be tweeting out at least five articles every single day to, you know, take hold of the national conversation. What he's doing right now by saying like, this is a media witch hunt about the whole Russia nonsense. Um, that's great, but that's also reactive. And he should be taking the reins as president, using the bully pulpit and directing the conversation away from the, what the lying media wants to talk about. So when did Steve Bannon leave Breitbart for the Trump campaign? Uh, it was August 17th, 2016. Did you notice a, a change in the culture of, of Breitbart immediately after he left or did it take some time? It took a little bit of time, but I knew instantly that day things had changed. Steve was certainly my, my biggest uh, champion defender at the company. And um, I think I, there were people on staff who, n maybe not with me specifically, but Steve would push things very far. You know, Steve loved Camp of the Saints. Well, people got a little bit leery of uh, that book and, you know, being called a racist for even acknowledging its existence, and especially with connecting it to the migrant crisis. So after Steve left, I knew things were going to be different. And um, over time, we really powered through the election. It was it was incredible. But things, the management wasn't as responsive for new pieces. They were very leery of some breaking news investigations. Articles, you know, perhaps looking into, in Twin Falls, Idaho, there was that horrible rape of that little disabled five-year-old girl by refugees. And um, th that town has a whole thriving refugee resettlement industry going. And, you know, one of our articles linked that to um, the Jabani Yogurt Factory, which um, had a, a Turkish man uh, running it. And instead of just going through that article and saying, okay, you know, here's something we could correct, Breitbart just spiked it without explanation. And that article is written by um, our top investigative reporter, Lee Stranahan, um, who is now, who has left Breitbart after clashing with uh, management over how to cover the White House, among other things. So they would just simply back away from articles if they had to do with you know, Black Lives Matter, race and crime, that sort of thing. And it wasn't explicit like, well, this group is committing crimes. This is awful. It was just even with the story I wrote saying the FBI has just issued a report stating, you know, out of 50 some cop executions, several were directly inspired by media coverage of Ferguson, of Trayvon Martin and, and other police shootings like that. They didn't even want to run that article. And I thought that was peculiar because even like another outlet like the Washington Times was covering it in great detail. So I felt like they were just trying to recalibrate themselves, figure out where they want to go after the election. And I think that they, they do want to be a well-respected, well-liked New York Times of the right or the hill of the right. Instead of this, you know, sort of burn down the building, you know, we're going to take no prisoners approach that we had under Steve. Well... Who is responsible for this change? Is it the Mercer family? Oh no, I I I don't think so. I think um there was there was Steve Bannon and then who is our uh, Breitbart executive chairman and then there's Alex Marlowe, editor in chief, Larry Solov, our CEO and president, John Kahn, who is our COO. Th these folks I think just had a different vision for the company than Steve did, and you know that that's fine, but I don't think it's a a smart one, and I think that they're trying to be all things to all people, and it's not going to work. You know, you've seen their traffic plummet. Um, in February, we were 29th on Alexa rankings, and I think uh, Vanity Fair just reported we were 67th now, and that's a quite a, quite a drop in just a few months. So, and you know, you, you can be cautious and things like that, but they don't seem to want to move on much of anything, and they seem more frightened of what the liberal media will say about them than anything else. 
And certainly I understand that, you know, you have to be careful and you have to think about, well, we've lost 95% of our advertisers, but I just think curling in a ball and hoping it all goes away while you keep doing rewrites of existing news stories is not the path forward here. Well, let's talk about the advertiser boycott. I mean, what was your feeling in the newsroom? Was the idea that uh, they're out to destroy us or this is something that could be weathered? What did you think? We didn't talk much about it. I just kept, you know, breaking news and editing and things like that. But I, I knew it was a problem. And um, I could see how it was, it seemed to be wearing on the company. People were getting nervous over being called like a hate site. And, you know, and right during the RNC, Steve told a Mother Jones reporter, we're the platform for the alt-right. And now you see Breitbart saying uh, in the Washington Post shortly after I was fired, just saying, well, we're the number one conservative family-friendly site. That's uh, quite a difference. And I think they're just trying to calm advertisers down. They're trying to get Amazon not to flee. And, you know, that's understandable. But you can't rely on corporations that hold diversity seminars to keep you afloat whenever you're Breitbart. Well, I mean, as far back as I think 2004, the SPLC was denouncing Dinesh D'Souza. And if they're going after someone like him, then <laughs> obviously everyone on the right is, is a hate figure. Well, and the SPLC also put Ben Carson on their, you know, hate list. He had his own profile um, because of his positions on, you know, same-sex marriage. And after a great uproar, they took it down. But in, in a way, you know, honestly, there's no going back now. You know, the SPLC was, and so, was furious, and so was the mainstream media, and so was uh, the conservative media for, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos and uh, Alun Bakari writing, writing that the conservative's guide to the alt-right, because... Even in acknowledging the existence of something further to your right is seen as evil, suspect, and full of hatred. That's, I, I guess, like, that's not family friendly, <laughs> um, but it, it certainly needs to be talked about. And I thought, you know, one of the things I loved about Breitbart, too, is it was a big tent. You know, you could have Milo, and then you could have people writing about pro -li very important pro-life articles. We all got along because we were all a family, and now I, f I feel like they're just trying to uh, draw circles and define themselves some more. And, you know, I feel like I was perhaps a holdover from a different era. And that's part of the reason why it was time for me to go. Well, what's your take on the Milo affair? I, I felt bad for Milo. What he said, of course, was, you know, he was, he was joking. But one of the things I wish Milo had done is if he said, you know, that I was abused by this priest, well, you should name him. You should say who he is in case he's abused more people. So that, that was a disappointment. Of course, Milo fell so far from grace. You know, he had just been on the Bill Maher show. He had a CPAC um, speech booked, and then all of a sudden he's like sideswiped completely by this uh, coordinated hit. So that's unfortunate. You never need, you never want to see that happen to someone who you like and respect. But on the other hand, again, I think he should have named his abusers and come out with this. I, I was surprised he did not do that, and I wish him the best. And it was a, it was a shame to see him go. Well, in retrospect. It it seems uh, what what happened was kind of inevitable because it seemed to me that they were creating a kind of sacred monster in him mm -hmm. that he was becoming I, I mean his all of his foibles oh let's let's talk about this man and how strange he is and such like and it sort of became a kind of burlesque actually Yes, and one of a couple of reporters and I had this f frustrations where Milo would wear a dress and give a speech, and that was our our front page lead for hours. Whenever you know we had original reports about crime, the DNC, the primaries, you know things like that, ready to go, but all this oxygen was being taken up because they wanted to turn Milo into some kind of star. And, you know, it's arguable whether or not that was good for him. So. I was sad to see him go, but it also freed up freed up a lot of real estate on Breitbart to push, um, you know, <laughs> news again. Now, we see a similar thing happening at Fox News, mm -hmm. that Fox News had uh, ruled the roost, cable news, for years and years and years. And then uh, the Murdoch family seemingly uh, decided that they want to destroy that, that they want to become uh, middle of the road and respectable. Do you find it odd that this happens roughly about the same time that the, the same thing happened at Breitbart? I uh, know. I think, you know, with the Murdoch, the younger Murdoch brothers want to turn Fox more liberal. And I, who, who's left? Tucker and Sean Hannity. Those are the only, you know, pro-Trump people left. 
Um, and I think Breitbart too is like sort of they didn't know what to do with their legacy, and they were just uncomfortable with it because it had just been it was it was Steve's per- personality pushed into the site and like giving it life. And so afterwards, you know, after he was gone, they thought we're just going to wind down here, hunker down, maybe wait till to see if the storm passes, and then try to be a more mainstream conservative company that they always wanted to be. It just seems like such an odd choice because of the change in the nature of American politics after Trump was elected. I mean, I knew that there were going to be freakouts. I knew that there was going to be sobbing and hysterical mm-hmm. behavior. But I thought that the left and the SJWs would calm down. They have not calmed down. They have got even crazier. And with that uh, that said, the idea on the right, oh, no, you know, we're going to, tr- what, try and make friends with these people? It's not possible. The left continues to radicalize itself under Trump. It's alarming how bad it's gotten. And even with this um, Alexandria shooter, James T. James T. Hodgkinson, he was a mainstream Bernie bro liberal who was radicalized by the media. He was not a radical leftist terrorist. We've had radical leftist terrorism in this country. This was a man who was told by the media over and over again, Trump is Hitler, Trump is evil, kill Republicans. <laughs> and he had on, on his person an assassination list. And he was liking groups, you know, his Facebook, if you got to see it before, it's taken down. It was all um, furious, frothing rage at Republicans and the rich and Trump. And this went on for years. And this is, you know, driven by the media. And these are not people who are ever going to be appeased. So it just surprises me to see people like Fox News and Breitbart seeing this temper tantrum go on and thinking that giving in is the best way to stop it. Maybe they won't hit you if you sort of uh, say, calm down, relax, we'll do what you want. What do you think uh, with regard to uh, the terrorist attacks while in Europe and America, do you think that they are changing anyone's opinion about Islam? Because, I mean, I had thought that given enough of these atrocities that people would say, and this would be reflected in the politics, okay, enough is enough. But instead, uh, the politicians, uh, with the exception of Trump, have doubled down on the idea that somehow this is our fault because of Islamophobia, and we just have to be nicer and more accepting of these people. Yes, and... Oh, I, I was just going to say, um, for years I've read Lawrence Oster, and Lawrence Lawrence Oster would always say, you know, liberalism is our religion, non-discrimination is our religion, and the worse Muslims act up, the the more we have to bend over to appease them and to treat to try to treat them better, and it's just it's a sickness, it's a sick religion that's gripped our society, and only a few people like Trump can seem to see through it. So I hear some people say, well, with another major terrorist attack like 9-11, people will finally wake up. No, that pe- more people are just going to die. What we need to do is you know, support leaders like Trump who will turn the tide of this immigration away and encourage people to just simply return to their home countries instead of having these huge pockets of no-go zones and hostile cultures and hostile peoples within our home nations. Well... The statement of the uh, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, last year, I believe, that this is this is part and parcel of living in a big city. Uh, my broadcasting partner, Kevin Steele, said that we're, we're literally talking about a PTSD here. Yes. Because that is supposed to be the condition of people in cities like London now, and I guess you're just going to have to learn to love it. I don't think anything has upset me or angered me as much as hearing that, because I shouldn't need to be told... Yes, well, the possibility of having your 11-year-old daughter run over and split in half by a truck driven by a crazy Muslim jihadi, that's just a fact of life. That's something you'll have to accept if it happens. By the way, don't ever say anything bad about Islam or we'll arrest you. This is not acceptable in my mind. And I think a lot of people feel the same way, but, you know, maybe they don't necessarily want to lose their jobs for (laughs) saying things in these blunt terms. Which is also why I think you see, um, you know, Twitter with all these uh, sock accounts popping up um, all over the place because people, they have to say something and they say it through uh, sock accounts and they say it through their votes right now. And I'm hoping that we reach a point very soon where people, normal middle class people with families just simply say, look, enough is enough. You guys have to go back. (laughs) Now, 
When you were at Breitbart, was there an, an official Twitter policy? Uh, no, not really. I think, you know, someone like Alex Marlowe, our editor-in-chief, he was, he was leery of it because he said the way people talk to each other there is very toxic. Um, he said this, you know, in the Daily Beast article about, this is a couple years ago, about Breitbart whipping up hate mobs, you know, to go after people, which is total nonsense. Um, in, in a sense, he's right because, you know, uh, but on the other hand, like the banter is fun. Breaking news on the site is fun. Um, and I've, I've met so many friends through Twitter, um, so many great friends. And, you know, once you learn how to use it, it's, uh, it's very exciting. And, uh, you know, I have to say it's like uh, one of my good friends is uh, Charles Johnson, and he taught me how to use Twitter. He taught me sort of how to weaponize it. And it's a great tool. And you see the same thing w with Trump and with people like Mike Cernovich and, you know, Ann Coulter. It's just another tool. It's very exciting. But on the other hand, yeah, you just have to, you know, you can't, and you can't get sucked into the, the toxic stew that it can be. You can't read your mentions and like cry over it and get sad. You just ignore it or you bounce back and you move on. But I think that the firestorm that Twitter is capable of whipping up um, does turn some people off. How many times have you been suspended by Twitter? I'm not sure. I, I, I've been suspended. I deactivated my account for a short time back in 2015 because uh, it was getting a little intense out there. And I, I was just like, whoa, this is too much. I'm going to take a break. But I was only suspended or rather locked out of my account for an entire week after I started that We Search for Bounty after I was fired. And I got an email in German from Twitter.com about this saying, your tweet saying Muslims um, committed the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, violates our hate speech policies, essentially. So your account will be locked for a week. And I couldn't do anything except for send direct messages. And then for some bizarre reason, I was shut out utterly and completely uh, for a while there in the middle of the week because, you know, they said, oh, you can still access your DMs, but they completely throttled me. And I think they did that in part because um, they didn't, they saw someone who might be speaking up and that might um, inspire more people and it might cause, you know, a, a landslide of public opinion. And so they just cut me off right away. They're like, no, this is our platform. You're not speaking on it. We're going to, you know, wait till you cool down. They put me in a timeout corner <laughs> for a while. But that was the only time. Other times I've been uh, totally free to just, you know, tweet as I pleased. And I think it was only after, you know, June 4th, June 5th, that they decided to bring down the hammer on me. Well, my own experience has been such that, you know, I, I wonder often whether Twitter is a waste of my time for the reason that I am being throttled mm -hmm. and I'm frequently shadow banned. But I've noticed that I have been moderating what I say on Twitter more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not my true voice any longer because I, the problem is I have invested so much time in it, you know, to promote this podcast largely that I'm thinking, no, I, you know, if I get uh, struck off Twitter, then I'm going to suffer a big loss. I, I wonder what your feelings are in regard to I me. Mean, like how, how hard should we push back? Well, it's a, it's a good question that this chilling effect where you find yourself policing your own thoughts and speech until you don't even know what you think or how to say it anymore. And I think that's the most insidious thing about the shadow ban, you know, with Twitter being a monopoly that reserves the right to um, boot anyone off its platform for no reason except for you violated our policies. Well, what are your policies? We're not going to tell you. Yes, that, that certainly does have a chilling effect on speech. And Twitter even told me, you know, if you violate our policies again, we will suspend you permanently. I have no way of knowing which what they're going to pick up on. They could dig up a tweet from like 2013 and say, yep, this is a violation. You're done. So people do invest all this time into this like excellent tool, this excellent platform, but it can be taken away from them at any moment. So I think you see people shying away, uh, backing away, and you know it's working as intended, unfortunately. Now, you were fired for a tweet or tweets by Breitbart. Was it made explicit to you exactly what it was you were being fired for? Ah, uh, no. They just said it's time to part ways. But it was over. It was over the, um, you know, the the Muslim immigration one because, like I said, that the media backlash was so intense and so ferocious, and you had um, CNN writing about it and quoting, you know, I think four different Breitbart employees, you know, saying this is appalling, this is dumb, this is bad. So it, it was just, it was over that. I think it was a few people said, it, it's time to give her the boot. And so they did. Uh, but, you know, that's all right. I'll be vindicated. <laughs> um, nothing but optimistic about the future. Well, this term inflammatory was used. 
mm-hmm. you know, not incorrect or variations on that, but inflammatory, which strikes me as odd, uh, given that uh, Twitter is largely an inflammatory platform and that uh, Breitbart is largely or was an inflammatory publication. Yes. Yes, and I think that was uh, Pax Dickinson that tweeted that, or not Pax Dickinson, I should say, his satire account that, that tweeted, you know, what Katie said is wasn't incorrect, wasn't untrue, it was just inflammatory. And this is a complete 180 from how Breitbart was run under Steve. It was extremely inflammatory. And I would say inflammatory, that's a weighted negative word. I would say provocative, lively, pugnacious, you know, engaging instead of inflammatory. Um, we were always, you know, hitting it you know, establishment Republicans, you, you, you've seen it. We even ran that famous headline, um, Race Murder in Virginia, written by John Nolte, who unfortunately left the company after the Michelle Fields ordeal. Um, whenever that black reporter shot two white reporters on camera, it made it very clear that this was a, you know, a racially motivated killing. And the conservative media absolutely flipped out at us about that. They were calling us all kinds of horrible things like Stormfront and, you know, Nazis, like horrible racists. You shouldn't even bring this up. But that's what Breitbart went. It was like, this is not inflammatory. This is simply true. This is what happened. And under current management, we would never run a story like that. Now, I believe when you were fired, um, Breitbart ran a story, comments by the Prime Minister of Poland saying pretty much what you'd said. Yes. Yes, they did. It was um, a a Polish minister saying, uh, you know, if you want less Muslim terror, stop importing Muslim migrants. And uh, Stefan Molyneux um, replied to that saying, breaking news, Breitbart News has fired Poland. <laughs> you know, so there's this sort of, it was just, it was just baffling to me. Um, but I, I think that they were, they were ready to start reshaping the company and moving on. And, you know, I had, it was time for me to go. Well, Which... I, I've noticed that this is, it's quite amusing to me that uh, the sites that post a great deal every day, Frequently, it happens that they run stories that are um, wildly contradictory within a half an hour of each other. Mm -hmm. Now, so you tweeted there would be no deadly terror attacks in the UK if Muslims didn't live there. And someone named Pej Vadat responded, you're a real moron. And Mm -hmm. you responded, you're an Indian. (laughs) Do you think it was perhaps that uh, that, no, uh, because I I actually deleted that um, right away because I was like, oh, that was that was incorrect. He's not Indian. Um, <laughs> and this is um, this was whenever the ethnic jokes were flying like thick and fast, and you had all these Irish jokes being cracked at me IRA. So I was like kind of joining in the fun, and um, then I realized it's like, oh, that was you know, uh, that was not correct. I feel a little bit bad about that one, so I just deleted it. Like whatever, and kept going on. But no, it was it was specifically the Muslim tweets and the backlash against that because that was that was like nothing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, your response to Vadat is uh, you know supposed to be beyond the pale, but I have to say I really don't think it is for this reason that we have all of this ethnic special pleading from ethnics. It's relentless in North America and in Europe. And it's like. I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, and and if you say you're so-and-so, oh my god, did you really say that? Oh no, I think I'm going to start crying here. (laughs) You've noticed that I am the person that I have been insisting that I am, you know, loudly and repeatedly. Well, yes, and you know, you should, um, it's like these people step into, like, they, they get into the kitchen, they're like, oh, I can't take the heat. It's like, well, then get out. Don't walk into this. And then cry whenever someone replies to you, you know, <laughs> it's just like the, the response to that baffles me, especially whenever people are like, I'm proud of being part of this group and I'm proud of being this and the ethnicity and, you know, this religion and you know, da, da, da. and uh, okay. But then whenever someone like teases you for it, you, you break down into tears. This to me is like shocking, especially, you know, how many times have I you know, heard all these you know, Irish insults, Irish jokes, um, you just have to take it in good stride. And these people are just cry bullies. You know, they don't know how to take a joke. They don't know how to engage except to point and cry and splutter. So what are you up to now? Well, I am doing contract work and I am writing when I can. And I'm also working on a book about the opioid crisis. Um, I'd like to title it something along of white death um, because we have a shocking amount of drug deaths in this country. And it's something that people, they, they can address it, but they're sort of um, feeling around the edges 
And I'm not sure if you, you had the opportunity to see this Washington Post article about these two researchers who, who um, looked at white deaths from drug overdoses, saying like, this is primarily, you know, white people are literally um, overdosing on heroin and opioids. They're killing themselves, you know, in record numbers. And they were excoriated furiously by the academic establishment by saying, how dare you write about whites? That was a direct quote. And they said, you know, black people are suffering so much more, so you should be focusing on them. It's like, well, sure, but okay, but white people are suffering too. Why can't we talk about white people as a group? What is the problem here? So I think that's just something I'm working on, something that needs to be addressed and brought into the national conversation. I'm fascinated by this subject because I sometimes think that uh, I'm the only uh, straight man left, and straight I mean in the old-fashioned way, that's not using some sort of mood-altering drug. There was a long story in the New York Times, I think last week, called the United States of Xanax or whatever. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, the number of people in America, uh, particularly in the elite or the aspirational class, who are on various, you know, mood stabilizers and the like. It, it just, it strikes me as shocking. And then at the lower end, you know, you, you have the uh, uh, opioids. What does it say to you about the way we live now that it seems that there are few people who can get through the day without using drugs? Well, you know, we, we live in this, I guess, you know, my posting career, of course, refers to this as scale. You know, we have this extremely atomized society where we all live in little boxes. We live in our little box apartments. We, live our, we go to our little box cubicles. We drive to and from there in our little box cars. And we're, we're isolated from each other. And, um, you know, there's so little sense of community. And diversity does affect, you know, affect this. People are less likely to trust even people who are like them when you're in a diverse setting. And it's also the fact, too, it's like we grow up. We move to a different town to go to college, and then we had to move to a different place to get a job. I and mean, we just keep bouncing around all of our lives. We don't put down roots. At the same time, you know, we're running this rat race while everyone has this ever-increasing student loan debt. They have credit card debt. They have car debt. No one's able to just simply have a one-income household, you know, support a wife and three kids on one income. And, you know, of course, part of that's, you know, manufacturing being wiped out. And so we have this, you know, economy that shuffles us all around, all over the place. We never get to lay down roots. And, you know, with the debt, you delay having children because you can't afford it. And it, it's just, it's incredibly stressful. And part of the reason, too, is, you know, we have this sort of uh, spiritual emptiness in our country. And I think that's why a lot of people are, you know, chasing oblivion whenever they take these opioids and why they try and stabilize their mood with drugs like Xanax. And one of the great things that um, has come out of this election, like, has been the elevation of Mike Cernovich. And what he wrote the wonderful book, Gorilla Mindset, you know, about changing the way you feel, you know, you can change your emotions. You don't need to feel anxiety all the time. And instead of, you know, take popping a Xanax, why don't you get up early in the morning, lift some weights and take a cold shower and start eating well? You know, it, it's the way we eat is so toxic and so unfortunate. And so there, there's a lot of things that individuals can do in their own lives to um, sort of curb the anxieties of modern life. But the system is built to keep us anxious, exhausted, and um, atomized from each other apart. When you look at the destruction of community that liberal capitalism has brought about, and the response of the traditional right is, oh, but the GDP uh, went yes. up 2.8% last year. And my reaction is, shut the hell up. You know, I remember it was not all that long ago that this acronym GDP appeared in the financial pages. It wasn't on the front page. It wasn't something that reporters talked about all the time. It's largely a meaningless term because government inputs count. I mean, governments in Canada and Alberta and Ontario, they're raising the GDP by going heavily into debt. And yet this, this vast abstraction, it, it, it's, it's taken over. It's something we worship now like a god. It's disturbing. It's like, and here we go back to, you know, Kevin Williamson saying, get out of garbage, you know, just rent a U-Haul, learn how to code whenever you're 55. You know, we talk about, and the conservative movement too, whenever they're not talking in abstractions, they're talking very negatively about individuals affected by these abstractions. And, you know, that's why, you know, Trump won. Again, he's saying jobs, jobs, jobs. I'm going to bring back jobs for you, for your family. And this is just something, you know, 
why is the conservative movement so get so excited about like putting on a bow tie and talking about the GDP? Why aren't they talking to struggling families, um, you know, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, people who are wrecked by the opioid crisis, who, you know, never got a college education, not that they need one. And they just, you know, it's the GDP, the GDP. Okay, fine. And part of that too is like propped up by, you know, mass importations of cheap labor, whose costs are socialized onto us, onto people already struggling. So it's just very frustrating to hear that kind of talk. And I hope they change direction soon. Oh, you know, they, oh, get a job. You can get a job at Walmart and McDonald's. Well, it's been known for a long time that Walmart and McDonald's make a point of letting their employees know about all the wonderful government gibs they can get. Because these places, their wages are so low that you wouldn't be able to survive without the government gibs. Exactly. I mean, the failure is built into the system that the conservatives are cheering. Yes. And we have to talk about dignity, too, here. Um, you know, you can humble yourself and say, I'm going to be a cashier at Walmart to try and pull through. But what dignity is there in being treated like crap, you know, surrounded by people who uh, t like don't speak your language, look, look nothing like you? share nothing in common with you, being treated like crap, working long hours, erratic hours, too. No, that's what um, I've heard. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I yeah. knew someone whose son worked for Walmart, and it was, okay, we want you by the phone, as it were. We're gonna, we could call you in at any time as to when you're going to work. We're not going to tell you. Yes, and it, what they'll do, too, is you'll arrange a babysitter, you're rushed to work, and they'll say, oh, I... Don't worry, the customers have dropped off to look at some model. You can go home now. So you're out of money and you, you know, already arrange for your kids to be taken care of. It's very hard on people. Um, and, you know, shift work is very stressful. You know, you, of course, don't get good sleep on that. And at the same time, it's like you can't even earn a living. You have to rely on the government for a handout. How is this dignified? How is this go get a job? Oh, problem solved. It's not solved. You've made someone's life worse. Well, going back to the question of scale, I wondered what you thought of this Amazon takeover of Whole Foods. I was reminded of uh, one of uh, Armando Iannucci's English productions where he was going on about Tesco's. And he said in the future that Tesco's had changed their slogan from every little helps to we control every aspect of your lives. Well, I hope I hope President Trump um, starts busting up some trusts. I hope he goes after Jeff Bezos hard, because I, I I don't know much about this trust busting stuff, but it's it's not good to see, you know, Amazon creeping in and slowly buying up all the companies that it can, just absorbing them like one giant mass. Um, that's giving Jeff Bezos too much power, and he's already got a six hundred million dollar contract with the CIA. <laughs> so I'm not exactly eager to give um, one person all this concentrated wealth especially whenever he feels nothing towards um, his fellow countrymen at all. Well, you know, I really think this could be Trump's legacy. I mean, Carl Denninger, I don't know if you're familiar with his writing, he's always uh, going on and explaining that if you look at the uh, medical care crisis in the United States, that these insurance and hospital cartels are against the law. They are against federal law. But nobody wants to do anything about it. I mean, the idea that you have a relatively simple operation that costs you $40,000 and, well, well, is there nothing we can do about that? Um, well, there are things that can be done about it. You could bring back the cash nexus, for instance. But uh, again, this is uh, you know one of those things where the uh, conservatives have taken the view that, oh, no, let's, bigger is better. Bigger is always better. And I always thought the conservative view was that small is beautiful. Yes. And I, I, I hope conservatives um, will, will drop this reflexive tick that they have about, well, trust busting, that's from the progressive era, therefore bad. And, you know, that, that's not a smart way to look at things. And I think Trump is the only person who can bust up these monopolies. And, you know, frankly, we have one chance. We might not have eight years. We might have three. You know, hopefully we have four. So the quicker the conservatives get on board with this stuff, the better off we'll be. But again, you know, as Trump has shown, we don't really need them. So they can get on board, they can join, they can join the winning side, or they can be left behind, and the train will run them over. <laughs> well, it seemed to be that you would have, you got a taste, just a little taste of what Trump is going through. Because after you left Breitbart, I searched on the web and read a few dozen stories. I mean, even outlets like the AV Club 
covered mm -hmm. this, and there was just this sickening gloating going on that you were one of the worst people on earth, and you had finally got your just desserts. Oh yes, and that's one of the things about the internet is you have you do have these these mobs and the amount of people taking like truly savage glee in seeing uh, me get fired. I was sad. And, you know, it didn't quite bother me because, you know, you have a lot of unhappy people in this atomized society, a lot of pent up rage, and they're looking to unleash it on someone. And so they, you know, they found a target, especially in the wake of a terrorist attack, whenever, you know, it's like, what do we do? This looks so bad. Ah, uh, you know, we'll, we'll freak out on Katie McHugh. Let's go after that person. And so, you know, it's a little bit, I, I, I'm more concerned about my family seeing these vicious things being said because they're just, they're just awful, a lot of them. Um, and they were very upset and disturbed by this. And yeah, in Trump, but look, I mean, Trump goes through this every day, every single day, and he has for, for at least two years. So, you know, I got it for a couple weeks. It was pretty, pretty rough. But, um, you know, he, he's under so much more attack and scrutiny and pressure, of course. Well, I'm old enough to remember the late 60s and early 70s, and there was a lot of fear on the right about revolution. But the revolution was coming from revolutionaries. It wasn't coming from, if you will, normies. Mm -hmm. When I, I look at people who are not allied uh, with uh, you know, socialist or communist revolutionary groups or anarchist groups, and the and the, the, the vitriol, the, the, the hatred, the all-consuming rage that they display. We have this talk about a, a civil war in America. Cold, they're talking about cold civil wars, maybe a hot civil war. What do you make of this? Well, we're, we're more divided now than we were at the time of the civil war. We can't even, we can't even agree on whether uh, a man and a man or, you know, which is not marriage, but like a man and a woman being married, that's marriage. So we just have this, you know, we should get peacefully divorced, but I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like or how that would happen. And I don't think we're going to have a hot civil war. And if we do, it's going to be like fourth generation warfare. It's not going to be pretty. And I don't think anyone wants that. But the, like I said before, the left is just amping itself up endlessly and radicalizing itself under Trump. And the media is, you know, they're always calling him Hitler. And then they'll play down these assassination attempts you know, you remember whenever that man charged him on uh, during the primaries on the stage, and uh, CNN gave this person an interview later, um, and I think this person's name was Thomas DiMasio, saying, well, you know, of course, I thought Trump was a bad man. That's why I was protesting. That's why I did what I did. And you also had someone uh, shoot a delivery man, a mail delivery man, and he said very proudly, like, I'm so proud to have killed Donald Trump. And this received, you know, no media attention. So we have a lot of um, turmoil right beneath the surface as the media is deliberately whipping up, and I don't think it's going to end well. I, I think it's only going to get worse um, in the next coming year, and I'm, I'm very sorry to say that. And this is one of the reasons, too, why I think Jeff Sessions should start looking at um, Antifa, Antifa as a terrorist group, because you know these people are only going to get more and more emboldened to attack people just simply gathering to support Trump. Well, I think this is an example of how Antifa is an example of how diversity lowers standards across the board, because the traditional view was, okay, masks, you wear them on Halloween, or you go mm -hmm. to a fancy dress ball. But other than that, we don't wear masks because that's sinister and frightening. And so then we get all of these uh, immigrants uh, from the Muslim world, and the women are, many of them are masked. And so now this becomes acceptable. If it's acceptable for them, why is it not acceptable for us? Well, um, yeah, I, I guess it's, you know, they, they may or may not be two different things, but, you know, it's very eerie in public to see masked people. You know, it, it breaks down trust even more. And um, I, there was a, a, a court sketch going around the internet a couple weeks ago um, with these two, uh, these two or three women who were accused of, you know, trying to aid ISIS or something. And the court, the court guy simply drew like rectangular black blo blocks because it's all they, they were completely covered head to foot, and that's just so eerie and unnerving. It's the same thing with Antifa. It's meant to intimidate. It's meant to make you feel unsettled, um, and it's meant to say like. We are immune from whatever you would do to us, but we can do to you whatever we want. I wanted to ask you one last question, and it was about blackpilling. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you mentioned MPC, and they've gone on a ferocious attack uh, against anyone who has criticized Trump. I, it seemed to me that, that there should be some sort of happy medium. I, I mean, I have known politicians. I know the way that they think. And what they want is 100% loyalty at all times. Uh, there's a famous story about uh, Earl Long, uh, Huey Long's brother, who was governor of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And an aide had told him, you know, I'll always support you when you're right. And Long said something like, you stupid bastard, I need you to support me when I'm wrong. Politicians, they, they want, they demand loyalty. But how much loyalty do you think that we we owe, we owe them. I think we should follow Andrew Breitbart's model and be happy warriors. I think a, a you know a, a medium is important to strike, and I think we can tell say to Trump like, you know, we str your base does not support this action. You know, we we strongly you know disagree with you here, but at the same time, like completely have his back um, whenever he's tormenting the media or whenever the media is lying about him, whenever Democrats are trying to stop him, whenever Republicans are trying to thwart him. So again, I think that that's just, we can be individuals and still have, you know, I, I don't look at Trump as some kind of dictator. Um, he values loyalty, of course, but, you know, again, we should be our own happy warriors making own, our own differences in our own lives and um, trying to, you know, reach out through our social circles to change things and give our president support whenever he deserves it. And again, he's in the arena and increasingly a lot of us are too. And, you know, you don't really know what that's like until you step into it. I got a little taste of that on June 3rd, June 4th, June 5th, but, um, you know, I'm not going through that every day. So we had to keep that in mind too, whenever dealing with Trump and he's the president, he does know a lot more about what's going on than, you know, we do. Well, Katie, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure having you. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it.